So thank you very much, Chris, and also thank you very much to everyone here, uh, particularly uh, any First Nations per people and the traditional custodians of this land. Um, in recognition as well, I'm Dr. Sarah Jane Pell. Um, I'm feeling okay today. <laughs> and um, I've come from uh, Melbourne, Australia, home to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future as well, for custodians not only of country and culture, but of cosmology, which is close to my heart. So I'm not as high tech as the guys that you've seen before. Um, high tech for me is a, means a different kind of thing. I'm really interested in reality, not just augmented and virtual, but the here and now. And these are the kinds of headsets that I'm used to wearing, the ones that deliver air. So also in recognition today, I'm going to ask you now to stand up, to be aware of your body, to be aware of your breath, and take a moment, a moment of remembrance, for those who have served, who have explored. And I'm going to play a short work. It's only about 60 seconds, but it gives us a minute, a minute to contemplate what it might be like to step inside someone's shoes, to step into a new world and defend a territory, to explore a territory. Please be seated. So the pace of my work is a little different, it's a little slower. I come from a tradition of a live art background where I'm placing the body in time and space in front of an audience and learning what it's like to be vulnerable and learning what it's like to be a human now in this part of the world, wherever this part of the world may be. And I'm trying to explore ways that media might help amplify some of those places. So not only looking at the live art, but the liveness of that. And sometimes new technologies, or even old technologies, can help me do that. So I began working with other artists to provide a different window into the experience, another layer into the experience with an audience. In this instance, I'm performing inside a little dome it's a confined space habitat. It's much like the precious little atmosphere that we have on this planet. I have a limited air capacity, a limited breathing space. So I work with a dancer who has a camera. And there they can have a portal view into the experience live on screen with them. And often the audience aren't aware that that's live. I begin the performance behind the audience and they're watching it, trying to work out, is that a body, what are they doing, they're inside this space. And then I come onto the stage and they see that it's for real and they're implicated. There's somehow this duty of care for each other, for me, for my audience, and for my audience, for me, until the work plays out. So I'm interested in the inner spaces and the outer spaces, those spaces which we inhabit, those spaces which we embody, and the places we go through the actions that we take, the steps that we take. I also have come from a background as a commercial diver, and I'm interested in how I bring that headspace to the audience, literally and figuratively. And in this particular work, 
I filled a helmet with saline and performed in the air, completely inverting the normal operand, op operation so that you could see the magnified bodily response and you could see my communication, my lifeline signals and so on. But there was a certain kind of pathos there. But what I was attempting to do was trying to bring something of experience of the real world and to talk about the poetics of it, but also the spaces I go to imaginatively. So underwater, working and operating, it's much like I don't drive a car, but many people here do. And I know you get in the car, you no longer really think about the mechanisms of driving it you're, or piloting it. You can think about other things imaginatively, and I certainly do that underwater. And the place I usually go is into space. So I started to build a practice. I trained and I'm working. I'm trying to bring the realities of these practices into a poetic engagement for the Actually, our heart rate lowers even if you're fearful, your heart rate will lower. And what I'm doing in this performance is I'm stopping all of that saline with my sinuses flooded, the little epiglottis at the back of my throat. So it's a reverse meditation, if you like. I have to forcibly stop it from relaxing to save, to save myself from being flooded. And every so often when I get too relaxed, I would start to ingest a lot and most elegantly have to splurt it all out like like a snorkel back at the audience and this was performed for 111 minutes after September 11th and also linking me to a story a personal story related to my grandfather and apnea suffering so this is one part of the diving experience this confined space experience the experience with the limited breath and the confrontation with the body but then another part of it the more, a more beautiful and poetic part is how we go into these spaces looking about how we might float and fly and how we might occupy neutral buoyancy or even microgravity so this began this was my introduction into a transition from underwater to space. How could I train underwater and prepare for work in a microgravity environment? Because let's face it, underwater, all I wanted to do was to fly, was to explore, and to continue and go on. Now, part of the one, part of the thing that I miss under, I guess, with my imaginings for space is that connection, that connection to deep sea and to our connection to the cycles of life that are so ever present there. But in imagining this future, I start to imagine kind of a sterile future, but also a future where our understanding of performance shifts. We start to think of ourselves as commanding a different type of performance engagement. I look at 
astronauts and thinks of the 2020, 2040 Olympiad off the planet and the things that we might be able to achieve of and conceive of. And this inspired a different approach to my work where suddenly I thought the idea of science fiction this, uh, could be merged with science fact in that sense. So no longer just the poetics, but perhaps some speculative future imaginings could occur too. If I'm going from deep sea, why not imagine a great imagine, uh, space walk as well? I teamed up with an exertion games lab and looked at creating little robots. And the idea was that these little aquatic robots would map and track my performance underwater. And if they could do that, perhaps we could then uh, use that information to work with spheres on the International Space Station to again translate and transfer that beautiful motion underwater into another, into a microgravity space. So I took some of the work that I had uh, done underwater and, of course, with Leonardo da Vinci wings, taking it very literally. And I worked with another group, a, a group of dancers from Ballet Lab in Melbourne, Victoria, and said to them, well, you have a land-based perspective and a beautiful understanding of performance. Let's map and track your action on land and let's see how you can then transfer and translate that underwater. And I compared that to some of the work that I had done or the, some of the projects that I've been working on. And we started to look at the technologies that would enable that. When we talk about motion capture, we're usually talking about on land. When we're starting to transfer to other systems where we need it to be extremely robust, waterproof and so on, and we're working in dynamic systems, we need to rethink even the calibration of that, the calibration that the figure zero point doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense for my robots, and it doesn't make sense for these dancers. And of course, they prefer disco. Because that's the rhythm that they were used to on land. And they miss that underwater. people, other professionals, but in a sense without that diving background, without that body of knowledge underwater, it was, it was frustratingly limited um, for, the, for both the technicians and the, and the dancers. So it, it forced me into a lovely position where I said, okay, I get to explore again. So I took this a little bit literally and said, if I'm on a journey to space, then there's a step in between. Let's look at mapping my body underwater and then at altitude before I get into a microgravity environment and perhaps there's something I can learn about the translation in between. So I picked a small um, project to begin with. I thought I would attempt Mount Everest and um, make artwork at various increments along the way. And if ever there, there was a stepping stone to space, that would certainly be an enormous one. And the idea was as well, could I use these tools? Bending Horizons is the documentary to capture the journey to the top of Mount Everest from mm -hmm. new and interesting angles. I'm going to just talk myself for a moment over this. But the idea was, if I had this body of knowledge, could I make performances during the acclimatization process where I'm going up and back over the same territory, building up this kind of resilience to the environment? And knowing that the signs and symptoms are very similar to working underwater. And if I could, what kind of technologies could I use? What kind of mapping technologies? What kind of digital or immersive or communication tools could enable me to send a sign of life? So not just the poetry of it, but how could my family at home understand where I was and what I was going through? And from an artistic perspective, was there something that I could share in those moments of discovery and raw exposure that was something different in terms of contribution? 
So I set out on this uh, journey with a, a fantastic team and I had mapped out the increments along the way and I'd set a number of targets for myself. So at this interval, it would be a poetic reflection. At this interval, perhaps I w it would be too dangerous to even take my glove off for five minutes at a time. So what tools can I use? Maybe I'm doing a laser performance work instead and, and recognising that batteries at those altitudes and at those heights um, they're going to freeze. I'm not going. To, I'm going to have three minutes left on my GoPro battery. And what else? What other kind of technologies do I need? So I went through the planning stages of that. I went through the training. I, I began the expedition. Things were going really, really, really badly. I got to Everest Base Camp. I had already lost three of my team to altitude sickness before 5,000 meters, and my expedition lead had dengue fever and had to return to uh, India. So the company said, hang on, you no longer qualify for the group permit. You need a solo permit. And uh, that costs another 21,000 US dollars. So things are a bit challenging. But along the way, I, I kept records and I tried to document the experience and I tried to make work and, and keep positive and keep reframing it. I was on a mission, not just a mission for survival and, uh, but also an arts mission, which it meant communicating the experience as much as I could throughout it. That year, I faced the 2015, the Nepal earthquakes. So I didn't get much further than that. And what became really critical was the confrontation that actually, to send signs of life, and to document the experience in real time was in fact the challenge of this mission. And that was the challenge that was most difficult, particularly in a real high risk and emergency situation. The time, which I guess is most critical, um, it was the most problematic. And I learned a lot about having to hack technologies on the fly to even get a sign of life to loved ones to say that I was there and to support people. But that happened. So, in a way, dealing with that, I was looking for other projects that weren't as... Mm, I was adding complexity to something that was already complex. I wanted to simplify. But I also needed to process what was going on. And in, a, in this particular work, it's a science fiction film work where I'm working with a, a Sean Wilson uh, on his film, so it's not mine, I'm not taking direction for that, but I became a lost astronaut, an astronaut lost in both time and space, um, going through a series of hi historical um, environments that came out of um, an encounter this artist had had with um, 14th century paintings, to be honest. And it gave me that little stepping stone back into reality to remember what it is that the mission was and why I do what I do. And my first love was that of the ocean and my mission was to get to space. So I joined Project Moonwalk when I returned back, uh, back to Earth, I guess, as you say, which was a human robotic interaction project um, looking at both human to human, so astronaut to astronauts and human robotic interaction, first in a pool, and then underwater. This also led to an opportunity where I could join uh, Project Possum. Uh, this is a civilian uh, scientist astronaut uh, training program for a suborbital mission. So I probably need to talk to Stu and those kids as well because I'm you know, looking at future suborbital missions and participation in that and where we might go and the kinds of things and questions we need to prepare for to enter into those spaces. Um, this includes all kinds of spacesuit validation testing. So you can see my live art background gave me a little advantage here. Some of the other pilots had never worked with these kinds of systems. I'd been working with them underwater for many years. But my challenge was, uh, oh, this hasn't played. Oh, there we go. But my challenge was beginning to Use this as inspiration for a practice to share my story. Using 360 degree motion capture, using simulation materials, using real life materials, 
incorporating the training, incorporating the process, incorporating the play, and the hardship, the challenge. It's hard to bring it all together. fortunate to, give it, to be given an opportunity to look at performing astronautics, no longer underwater, but performing in space. And how could we even possibly imagine that? And that led to a collaboration with some of the um, people here, the Agency of Human Robotic Lunatics. I mean, where else would you start? As my dad said, she hasn't just gone from becoming an artist to an astronaut. She's always been a space cadet. So we began here. Um, so working with uh, both Jameis and Charles um, in a collaboration that was commissioned, we hadn't actually met each other, and it was suggested perhaps we would come together to explore storytelling from a different perspective. So we took the story of the human robotic um, experiment underwater, this, this project Moonwalk, and we said, well, how can we use a land-based system to share that story? And how can we extend the possibility of keynote speaking into this kind of augmented reality where the human robotic interaction with the cinematic technology live on stage was echoing and reflecting that which was underwater? And how could my body and my action on stage command and puppeteer the spacesuit and the various inhabit, the various environments in which I transitioned from the pool to the ocean and then imaginatively to the moon, which is where I was asked to go in my mind as I was conducting the simulation over various weeks underwater in Marseille. So again, I slow this down and I use the music to slow it down. can tell you, and both Charles and James can tell you all about the tech that made this happen. All I had to do was tell the story on stage and to, to perform and move in an odd way so that the avatar made sense. The avatar was limited, it's wearing a spacesuit. I wasn't, I had to remember and imagine that. And we could take some of the tools that we'd actually literally used they were rendered into the, the vision on screen as well. And we could interchange with video documentation, we could interchange with audio. We could start to play around with the layers of presenting this. So this was a creative development showing at Robotronica in a QUT a few months ago, which was a lot of fun. So another work that I do more independently is a quick science fiction film where I've tried to explore what it might be like to be on Mars, to use this performance engagement in an environment that doesn't yet exist and to use a different type of technology for that. So there's layering of um, different animation that occurs to kind of get us there. But once we're there, I'm using green screen, screen technologies as well um, and VFX to enable me to explore literally, well, it was a fantastic virtual, I mean, real simulation, and then I was adding these VFX elements to it to, to tell a story. And in this time, it was a particular, I'd landed in the Kimberley region. There's a Kimberley region marked on the Mars map, which echoes the place that we know here on Earth. And we know there are ancient riverbeds there. So in this particular story, I have an encounter, again, with a sea life, another body of water. Um, and I become the fish. I become the body of this fish through an hallucination by, by sucking in and drawing in and becoming intoxicated 
by a breath taken through an old drill hole left by the Curiosity rover some years ago, which we might remember. If I could fast forward this, I would, but I don't know how to run this thing. Oh, I can. It gets a bit crazy. There's a bit of fish flapping. Whatever you believe and embrace, and realize, you're creating a whole new world. You get to walk around knowing while that you want to elegant yourself in, you're going to wake up in this extraordinarily different space. So there is no end and there is no beginning. There is only the boundless promise of So another quick work, um, just to finish up, sorry to take so much time, um, but also looking at using layered um, virtual reality and um, green screen in real time with an audience so that on the screen we can be immersed somewhere else. Um, this was a, a work where the, the audience was stranded with me. We had all landed on the moon, but we were quite away from where we were meant to be picked up. And we as a group had to go through and determine all of the survival tools that we were going to need as we reached out to get to the rendezvous point. Now this is an exercise that occurs. Um, NASA use it all the time um, with various groups. But we did this and had the live link-ups. We had comms between audience systems. We had this, cra I don't know, this crazy woman venturing out to, uh, to get the sing signal sent through. And we all survived, I'm happy to say. So you can see the camera used there with this live AR happening, which enables us to transport between various spaces, sort of live and mixed. And the audience gets on board. It's, no, it, it's easier for the audience to get on board if it's no longer in this real live art situation where life is at risk. I don't know why that is. It's been fun. And this is a new tool I'm playing with uh, at the Monash um, Immersive Visualization Lab. And we're looking at a collaboration next year where we're doing uh, a live VR performance streaming from this uh, cave or cove, um, which is almost 360 degrees as well, which is a beautiful space. Um, so I'm sure there's much more playing to happen before I get to fly or dive again, but uh, um, that, that's the kind of trajectory and the relationship that I'm having with these technologies at the moment. So thank you very much.